Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Giant Pod with me, Andy Rintmore. My guest this week is my good friend, Nick Wilton. He is best known as bassist in The Operation, as bassist and vocalist in Ghost of the Avalanche, an all-round instrumentalist and singer of Meadow Burials. We talk about his time in his first bands at school and how you get started saving up for uh, equipment. We talk about being hard on yourself and expecting more of your band live. Uh, we talk about going to LA and being courted by uh, major record labels. We talk about the great music industry crash of 2008 and subsequently losing record deals. We talk about how you deal with that. We talk about projects that come after it stepping into the songwriter's position. We talk about all kinds of things. It was a great freewheeling chat about his life and his experiences in a, in a largely DIY, uh, but successfully DIY um, area of the music industry, let's say. And it was great. It was a great chat. And uh, we go back for many, many years. I, I love and respect Nick greatly. And I think you can hear it in this pod. And uh, so, yeah, I'm just not going to babble on anymore i'm gonna let you guys have it here it is nick wilton on the giant pod hope you enjoy this one i don't know why a band hasn't released the greatest hits yet mm. with a pie chart of their stream stats That's of every idea. song every song on the maybe like company. maybe like data core is a, a new genre we've just invented yeah and, and then they sing in binary <laughs> yeah zero one one zero 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 one 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 zero 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 oh. um <laughs> or, or, or all the lyrics just re- just reference percentage increases and stuff <laughs> like i'm 35 percent more angry with you now <laughs> yeah gdp 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 yeah <laughs> this one's got gdp Okay. One, two, three, four, but da, 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 GDP, GDP. It's like a Patrick Bateman from American Psycho. That'd be his <laughs> band, wouldn't it? If he was the front man of a band. <laughs> yeah, I love that scene with the um with uh with the um business cards. Oh mate, it's amazing. So I good. love it. And he has like business card envy. Yeah, have you seen the the YouTube um Someone's done a you know re-edit of that, and they've swapped out the business cards for Pokemon cards. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I need to see that. It's really good. So good. Oh my god! Look at that thing. Yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's shiny. That's amazing. <laughs> it's, a shiny, it's a shiny Charizard first edition. Uh, talking of lengths of songs, mm. I was just looking at your Meadow Burials discography on Spotify. Mm. The Modern Age, which you, rela- you, you released last year in 2020. Do you know how long that is in total? Uh, I know for a fact that there's no song over a minute long. So it's right. definitely like, I'd say, I'm guessing now, two minutes 40. Two minutes 30. Oh, that's not bad, see? Not that's bad, not bad productivity given it was 2020. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you know, there, there's a reason for that. There's a reason right. why with that whole things like Melody Barrels is kind of like short punk songs but with that mm. particular release the reason there's three songs and they're under a minute long each is because initially I was thinking I want to put some music out on floppy disk <laughs> right <laughs> so I was okay. thinking your off the shelf floppy disk can only hold 1.44 megabytes of data back to the data see right and, uh, I was like okay and I talked to Ben Turner you know very well yeah producer and I was like I think I want to put this out on floppy disk he just sort of just didn't say anything. Looked at me strangely <laughs> and carried on with the session. And um, but that, that's why that's why there's only three songs in it and why they're under a minute long. It was it was almost like a, a, a restriction I put on myself on purpose, like right. put some music out on floppy disk. <laughs> and then and then I eventually realised that was a terrible idea. And um and luckily enough, uh, the label that puts out the Meadow Barrel stuff liked it enough anyway to to, to release it. And then we did it on a, a lathe cut seven inch because we could fit all three songs on one side. So it kind of worked out okay. Oh, Sick Ones did a lathe cut of mm. the the red line. I've got it. Have you got it? Yeah, yeah. Mate, I don't have it. Um, <laughs> I've got yours. Char- <laughs> Charlie was like, uh, Andy, we got to give we got to give a lathe cut to um, this chap who was flying out to um, I don't know where he was going, some LA or something. Yeah. He was going to go to. 
Oh, it was a big record label as well. I won't say who it was in case I've got it wrong mm. or in case I've got it right and it and it's unprofessional. But it, it was a, a fairly big sort of undergroundy like alternative record label. Yeah. And he was going to go and he was really good friends with all the people there and he was going to go give them this lathe cut. And it was like, Andy, you're the only one in the band with with a copy of it. So yeah. can you give him your copy of the lathe cut? And I was like, oh. <laughs> Well, I don't want to give away my, you know, mate, my it, one copy. <laughs> that's so weird because I felt I felt awful the other day because um, with Ghost of the Avalanche, we did a, an EP called Civil Unrest, which we did to cassette. And I posted something the other day, like a picture of one saying, oh, who got one of these? <laughs> and the producer, apparently, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, <I'm> like, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm now a talk. Like, <laughs> it's like, do I send him my copy? Or, right. You know, so it may, maybe I don't know that we can work something out here where you can have my sick one slave cut, I can have your Ghost of Avalanche cassette, and we, and everything is kind of square in, in the universe. I don't know. We're groovy then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. G- give me my stuff back. I, just and, felt, uh, I felt I... awful. I felt so bad about it. I was just like, oh, he put, he, you know, he did us a deal in the studio time. He's a really good friend of mine. And I was like, I think he sort of said, oh yeah, do, give me, you know, keep, just keep one back for me. And as you know, in the the craziness that is live shows, these things just go missing. And before I know it, I didn't have any copies. That has the energy of, um, <laughs> have you seen that, like sort of that gum tree thing where it was like, hi, is the, <laughs> hi, is the Xbox or whatever is still for sale? And the guy goes, <laughs> the guy goes, no, sorry, I've sold it. Thanks anyway. And then the reply is, thanks, my son's crying now. It's just, it's just kind of got, it's kind of got that energy like, well, I didn't get one. Yeah. Um, no, no. I, I, oh, it's funny man. how these things, you, you always worry, don't you? It's like, oh, we're going to get, well, I definitely worry. Like, oh, am I going to shift all these copies? Uh, well, yeah. I get rid of them. And it's like, now I don't even have a copy. And I'm trying to steal, <laughs> steal copies that I made my mum and dad buy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You could just you should just take a picture of it on the sh- rock up to theirs and just swap it out for the like a Polaroid of it. They won't notice, man. They, they really so wouldn't notice. I'd be like, if you still got that Operation CD from like you know, actually no, they probably still do, do, do listen to that. But any of my punk stuff, they they think they just do it to amuse me. It's lovely, you know. They're very supportive, but. They wouldn't notice if I took so a ghost. Just humouring you with all this punk rock shit, are they? Yeah, well, I forced them to buy it. I'm like, you know, I need to look good. The label needs to think I'm popular. So buy my stuff. Buy <laughs> I need strong pre orders in yeah. Q1. Yeah. Data Q1. Core. Data, Data Core's core. not going to take off unless, <laughs> unless we get these stats. <laughs> Okay, so uh, where do we go now? Let's go. Let's go to the beginning of okay. Nick Wilton. So you're in the womb. Whose yeah. womb are you in? My mum's, I think. <laughs> <laughs> ja- uh, Jacqueline Wilton's womb. All right. Yeah. And then you ac- you exit Jacqueline Wilton's uh, uh, womb. Can we miss out the bit in between? We'll go, <laughs> <laughs> we'll go from in, in utero to to outro. Yeah, you've, 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 <laughs> In, in outro, in outro, um, yeah. um, and uh, and and you grow up. At what age do you start to think, okay, music is this is uh, something about this music lark? It's it's weird because I think I've always you know I know it's the the typical response, but I've always been into music. I, I remember from a very young age, not even being aware of different genres or you know what that means in terms of identity and that stuff, but just being. I def- definitely remember long car journeys my dad's a, a big driver and we always seem to be driving to somewhere like i was on holiday or to my grandparents up in yorkshire that kind of thing so there's always these long journeys where music would be be present in the car and because you're not doing anything else in the car really you know it's just absorbing the stuff and it was a real weird mixture um of my my parents tastes i guess so you sort of beatles and bob dylan stuff like that from my mum's my side and she was into the the folky stuff and some prog rock like yes and things like that and also classical music. And then my dad's, he's always enjoyed music, but he's not been like a connoisseur, let's say. He, he's liked, like just what he likes. And, but one of the mm. things that really stuck out is, uh, he always used to listen to this, um, Billy Idol CD. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with Billy Idol, but you know, mm. White Wedding, Rebel Yeah, all those kind of songs. So, and I used to really enjoy listening to this music, experiencing it. And, you know, it created images in my head. So classical music, I imagined like these, sort of battles, you know, like these Lord of the Rings style battles happening to this <laughs> classical music. And that was probably yeah. uh, inspired by, you know, my mum saying it sounds like, you know, monsters fighting or whatever, try, to try and get me into it. 
but I definitely latched on to the the more sort of I'd say straight up rock stuff um mm. and I I definitely remember when I was really young it was, it was Billy Idol we were listening to I remember that we were driving through town in through free and there's a point in the song I can't remember which song it is I had to look at it later but the music cuts out so the drums are, are playing and it cuts out it's just like a vocal and a, a some sort of guitar line and instinctively I knew when the beat was going to come back in and I remember thinking, oh, the drum's going to come back in. One, two, three, four. And the drums came back in. And it was a bit of a light bulb moment. It's like, oh, that's... It was that uh, um, affirmation that I, I knew I had something in me that knew that was going to happen, that I understood yeah. music. As a kid, I've always, you know, I enjoyed music at school and performing, being a bit of a uh, an extrovert. I was, I was more comfortable standing up in front of people than I was, you know, with the maths books, you know, it's that kind of thing. So it's always, it's always been there. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I had a, 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 a similar experience like you were saying in the car with the Billy Idol thing. It was when um, <laughs> when the Wild Wild West film came out with Will Smith Classic. and they did the, they did the soundtrack. I yeah. had the cassette in the car, and there's a moment in the thing where he says something, and then there's the music pauses, and then there's a gunshot, mm. and then it comes back in. And uh, I was used to uh, try and get the gunshot in time. Yeah. <laughs> And you still can't do it now, can you? <laughs> I remember being like, no, rewind it. I've missed yeah. it. <laughs> rewind it. I missed it. Just, I was yeah. obsessed with getting this, just with finger guns, just, yeah. Pow, da, 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 you know, just, and I guess uh, it, it was on the beat, I take it. It wasn't like some sort of weird. Um, I don't know. I'd have to listen back to Poly rhythm, I think, shotgun blast. Or something. I think it was, I think it was like, pause. Bow, da, 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 you know, back in again. So, what a great uh, idea. That's know, such a great production idea, isn't it? Right, right guys, yeah, we've got a gap just... here. We want a gun to fire. That yeah. <laughs> it's like a rap thing, isn't it? Having guns going off, uh, it's cool. Uh, and then gangster rap just did mm. it all the time. I remember buying a fifty cent C D called The Massacre. And the whole <laughs> for... <laughs> You do realise you just said that Will Smith was responsible for starting <laughs> the gunshot in rap music. <laughs> No, should I? No, yeah. that's, that's probably not true. But um, he made it mainstream. Yeah, he, and, brought, it to, <laughs> he brought it to the masses. <laughs> um, there's, 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 yeah, if you go and listen to The Massacre by Will, uh, Will Smith. <laughs> no, but by I 50 want that cent. to be a thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, the whole first track is someone loading guns, cocking them and... So fifty Convention cent, yeah, shot. yeah, yeah, fifty yeah. cent. We're, we're on, 50 we're cent. on slightly uneven ground for me. I, I can't profess to be yeah. a huge rap or hip hop, well, uh, just you know, fan. Well, not fan. Just I, something I, I thought I'd bring up there. Yeah, Some guns in guns in music, gunshots in Will Smith. There's a pie chart there, I reckon. Gun, <laughs> gunshots in Biggie Small. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so so from there, mm. you go. Okay, I have some sort of. Uh, instinct for music, let's say some internal rhythm. Let's say interest, it's probably a bit, yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Right. Interest. Uh, you find yourself somehow, somewhere playing a bass guitar. Mm. Is that where it begins for you, or, or did you try guitar? Did you try drums and key? Did you have a little recorder? What was going on? What was the. Uh, yeah, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, my mum always is into, you know, more sort of folky, rocky stuff, and she had a, a classical guitar that was in the house. And I used to like just effectively playing with it. I wasn't playing it, I was playing with it. Um, mm. And I remember when I was around, I think, eight years old, I asked for uh, an electric guitar for my birthday because I thought that was like the epitome of cool was an electric guitar. I still do, I think. Mm. Um, it is. So um, <laughs> I was very fortunate that for, I think, my eight, eight or ninth birthday, my parents managed to find a fairly decent, you know, secondhand electric guitar and a, an amplifier, a little practice amp. So I had my see this dream was in front of me you know what the 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 potential um but the only problem was is that um my hands i remember my hands at eight eight years of age were too small i couldn't couldn't and it was a full-size guitar so it was kind of out of my attention span and and grasp to be to to commit myself to it so it sat dusty in the corner of the room for a while but yeah in terms of other instruments there's always like yeah recorders of things at school and just bashing the demo button on the keyboard you know everyone does but um I was always trying to form a band even before I could play any instruments or even sing. So when I was at school, you know, some of the guys wanted to go and play football in the playground. I was like, nah, we should start a boy band. (laughs) (laughs) 
which you can imagine was really popular. So um, <clears throat> mm. I had I had two two friends of mine, that are, they shall uh, remain nameless, um, more for my own protection than theirs. <laughs> and um, <laughs> but they were part of this 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 group. And my first group I ever had was called uh, Jazz Three. Yeah, like the genre right. jazz. Nothing. There's nothing jazzy about us, but I just thought jazz was a cool word. And there's three of us, so we were jazz the, three. the Jazz Three. And I know somewhere. <laughs> And I keep on every year it pops into my head like there's a cassette somewhere. There's the Jazz Three demo. Can you imagine if I found that? What I would do with I it? Find it. <laughs> I got some demos. I've been thinking about <clears throat> sharing with the world. You should, man. It's, it's no point in it sitting there on the shelf, you know, or in a box in an attic. They are truly awful, but they're they're probably the most punk thing I've ever done. Yeah, well, I think Jazz Three was the most punk thing I've ever done because it was um, three guys with no musical talent whatsoever. <laughs> With a an old karaoke, spat my beer out there. <laughs> yeah, with an old karaoke machine, yeah, that had a, it had a it had a electronic drum pad on top, you know, and you get, like, what? yeah, it's like doof, 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 woo, you know, those kind of sound effects, and yeah. um, but what we there was there was <laughs> so lame. There was these the demo songs on this this drum pad, which you were mm. meant to drum along to. I was like, we don't need to write music. There's our music there. We've we've got these <laughs> these demo tracks. <laughs> These demo tracks are, are our band, our, our production. Right. So I used to <laughs> I used to play these demo tracks on this karaoke machine. We had one yeah. microphone. We'd all crowd around this microphone, and we we'd written lyrics to the songs. And I I can remember the. I'm not even going to tell you what the lyrics are to the first song. Oh, maybe. good one. No, because it, it's proper. Like it was just rhyming for the sake of rhyming, and now it sounds right. a little bit like incestuous. The the lyrics. So I, yeah, so <laughs> I can't believe you're oh. making me do this. So the <laughs> the first the you've dug this grave, the, man. The, the, <laughs> the, well, you know, we all start somewhere, yeah. And I yeah, and, right. I, and I started my songwriting career with incest. So <laughs> um, it really is the most punk thing you've ever yeah, done. Yeah, exactly. So I started off. The, the the song was called Moonlight. Yeah, which right. is you got the image in your head. The, the moonlight is cool. The first <laughs> the first line was Moonlight, so bright. Girl, you're mine tonight. Yeah, this is where it gets a bit creepy and weird. <laughs> so don't fight. So don't fight. <laughs> you're so bright. And then there's a rap bit, which was done by one of the other guys, which what? went. <laughs> it went. Remember the first time we hugged each other, like sister and brother. <laughs> and then it went. Girl, you're mine forever. <laughs> and then the refrain was moonlight, so bright. Girl, you're my girl, you're mine tonight. So don't fight. You're so bright. Moonlight. It's not awful. Wow, well, it's, it's not, not great. It's like it? totally terrible. I can. It's like it, it's like pretty on par with boy band stuff of the era. Well, maybe that's it. Perhaps we were, you know, we were better um, than the boy just, bands. Just wasn't much incest in the top forty back then. No. Yeah, perhaps we were ahead of our time. But um, <laughs> but you it's know, progressive man. Yeah, and that, that's that's recorded somewhere. And and a, and a B side that which you made up on the spot, and I think we uh, we definitely. I love this that you you've gone to the fact that, that you've said there's a refrain, yeah, um, and there's a B side. You've you've yeah. given this thing enough, yeah, so that it has terminology. I think I think the B side was called like on the way on our way to Wembley, which was written by one of my uh, bandmates, and it was right. it was football orientated, and I wasn't really into it. It wasn't it wasn't incesty enough for me. So you know? so. <laughs> So this should have been his side project. I mean, it's yeah. like, no, mate, this is your interest away from Jazz Three. But the best this thing is about your it, side project. The best thing about it is that, um, as I said, I'm not going to name names, but if I, I got a feeling like now, if those people knew I had this somewhere, I'm, oh, I'm, you'd be marked. Yeah, I think they're. You know, I'm sure they're. Uh, they've got their own thing going on in life. They probably moved on from Jazz Three. What I want to see is a where are they now? <laughs> well. <laughs> Uh, I'm pretty sure one of them might be in prison, like you know, which would make oh, right. for, that would make for a great documentary. And again, it's pretty punk. So maybe Jazz Three was the the most punk band. I can see it now that being a, 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 a like a Sundance Film Festival Critics yeah. Choice. Do you know what? When, when I when I said you know we, it'd be cool to do a chat with you for this, I did not think we would get <laughs> spend <laughs> ten minutes at least on Jazz Three. That's not how I envisage <laughs> this going. Well, man, I would appears we're doing a deep dive. Um, <laughs> So moving on from um, mm. the incest five, um, <laughs> <laughs> what's next? 
Um, so after that, I I <laughs> I had a break in my career for a but, few yeah. years. Just, but <laughs> just the fame got too much, yeah, for you, didn't it? Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't <laughs> couldn't handle the attention. <laughs> um, but um, no, I, I, the next step, I guess, was we, we, you know I had the guitar and and I got to an age probably twelve, eleven, twelve, and I started listening to bands at school. Uh, you know, I was in year seven or eight at school, and but names like Nirvana came up in conversation, and The Offspring, and Blink One Eight Two. So you had this whole thing where Blink One Eight Two and The Offspring were in the charts; they were on top of the pops. So that's resurgence of punk, pop punk. Um, but also the more like grungy stuff that probably my friends, older brothers were into, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so there's this real mix of, of new, new old and new, new stuff that was, I was being exposed to. So mm. and I was like, that's really exciting. That's, that reminds me of that stuff that I really was into when I, you know, the Billy Idol sound, that driving rock sound and, and that excited me. So I kind of, you know, I was, I was past the boy band phase and I was, but I was still in my top 40 phase at that point. Um, but then I found out about all these bands. So then I remembered I had that dusty guitar in the corner. I remembered how much I enjoyed doing jazz three and I really, <laughs> I really wanted to, um, you know, I was like, oh, I'll have another go at that. So I picked up the guitar, started having a few lessons with, um, uh, did you go to Oakfield or Selwood? Selwood. So do you remember Mr. Weeks? Uh, I know the name. Yeah, so, I know the face. I can't put the name and the face together, but I know I would know both of them. Yeah, so yeah, I think I took the guitar to school, this classical guitar. Or it might have been my electric guitar to, to like a show and tell thing at school one day. And I remember, I think it was Mr. Weeks, who was a math teacher, was like, oh, my son teaches guitar, you know? Uh -huh. So I had a few lessons with his son, a guy called Ben Weeks, who I think is still around in the area, I'm not sure. But um, so I learned some basic chords on the guitar. And, um, yeah. and at this, about the same time, and I think it was because of that influx of Blink Like Two Offspring, Nirvana stuff. There were bands a couple of years older than me. So I remember we went from a uh, Selwood school, uh they do those inductions at college, don't they, when they take you from year eight up to to from college to have a, a day or an assembly to see what it's like, that kind of thing. Yeah, they just you know, this go and introduce you to mm, um to the bigger world. To all the big scary kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would have been a problem for you though, would it? <laughs> you to the, the smaller kids. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah. we um so yeah we went to this assembly and i remember um it's gonna sound like such a fanboy thing but a good friend of mine nowadays uh joel pete played the assembly we went to see with his band at the time which was called yeah. just just fakes so just fakes yeah hopefully you won't mind me talking about oh, this i didn't know about that yeah here we go so it was Joel Pete on guitar, Richard Dimery on bass and vocals, a guy called John Graham on second guitar, and drums was Greg Freeman, okay? Right. So those four Already guys... Already a, a melting pot of what would be yeah. some very important bands in in Froome's music scene, and kind of, dare I say, globally. Well, definitely a global reach to a point, yeah, and and, yeah. and, and, and an ongoing influence still, I think. And then, yeah. But that band, Just Fake, Just Fake sorry, um... They played this assembly just as the school band, and I saw them. I was like, "That I want to do that. I want to be those guys. Mm. You know, I want to be." And that's and I kind of been trying to do that in, you know, form little bedroom bands and stuff in that time. So after that assembly, I came back to Selwood, and uh, that was it. I was like, "Right, music room. There's resources. Let's try and start a band." And I found some like-minded guys, probably inspired in the same way from that assembly or other things, and formed my very first uh, quote-unquote proper proper school band um <laughs> which was called swarm there we go that's that's a much better name than jazz three well you learn don't swarm. you swarm yeah that sounds good I, I would think that would be a thrash band yeah i don't think we really knew what we were you know we were right. a, we were a band and that was that was good enough for us so mm -hmm. i i was i was distinct i distinctly remember being in year nine and swarm being a thing um and we uh Went it was for a, a thing, man. It was a thing. Yeah, we went for a... It was to us. It was important to us, you know. We we It was what we did. It was our, our little escape. And um, and we played a couple of assemblies. So we we achieved, I think, what Swarm set out to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh, dude. I did an assembly with my um, first band, which we called Scream 92. That's a great name. Um, and um, I, I think it was probably because of the Misfits song Scream. Yeah. And that we were born in 1992. Well, um, makes uh, sense. Uh, uh, talking of talking of horrible lyrics, there's a there's a one song called "Love Doctor," 
And it was basically just like, there's a love doctor. He hates me. (laughs) (laughs) Why does he hate you? Uh, I don't know. And at one point there was some sort of lyrics sort of pertaining to like, what was it? Sort of like, having a wank or playing your Xbox or something. I don't know what it was. Yeah. It, 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 juvenile shit. But, yeah. you know, love doctor. It's it sort of stayed with me. But at least you're writing about what you knew, you know, what you know about. <laughs> <laughs> That's... We did, none of us had an Xbox at that point. <laughs> <laughs> you would play near the other thing though, wouldn't they? Yeah. What was it? Oh, is it? Oh, is it? Oh, no, this was like, he goes, orgasms or Xbox. Um, I choose Xbox because he was, he'd clearly been listening to the Buzzcocks. <laughs> did you did you ever record that? Because this sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, there's like two versions of it. I think the, I think I've heard this. You did you have. did you play M Block or was it K Block? Oh, I don't know which one it was. It was one of those sort of end of um, end of year thingies. Yeah, and I remember it was terrible. And the guy that was playing bass hadn't actually turned it on at the wall, and he was wearing a balaclava. <laughs> And 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 basically, we never we never encouraged him to turn it on. He never really knew it was it was on or off oh. when we played. So he just kind of didn't get any good at his instrument because he wasn't hearing it. He yeah. didn't know he wasn't hearing it. It was just stupid. maybe maybe if he turned the amp on, he would have got better at it. <laughs> well, yeah, but he wasn't very good at a lot of things. Oh, okay. <laughs> we, we didn't. We weren't optimistic uh, <laughs> yeah. about about his musical future. Right. And I remember playing it and thinking, this is going really well, but it went really, really poorly because I had no concept of four, eight bars. Mm. We would, I would play a part, mm. which would basically be me four on the floor, dum, 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 go, dum, go, dum, go, dum, go, dum, dum, with this thing going under it. And, and Ross, who was on the guitar at the time, Ross Powell, who mm. I know you know, yeah. would just have to like, play along and then not and we'd like nod and yeah. then we uh, change part that was it so there was no structure it's crazy I isn't no it no idea like, about structure i think it's, it's it's crazy you forget that stuff that you have to learn you know it's mm. now you take it for granted and you, you you know i often talk to um alex veal about this you know we we say it's never ne- it's never enough in a band is it like like i was saying you start off you play an instrument you're like wouldn't it be great if i could just learn how to play this instrument and it's yeah. Oh, and you get there and it's like, wouldn't it be great if I could be in a yeah. band? And then you get in a band and it's, wouldn't it be great if we had a gig? And and but each thing you, is never, never fulfilled. No, never. <laughs> and it's like now you're talking about that stuff like structure and the fact that you had to work things in blocks and change. And you kind of forget. You kind of forget yeah. that is you have you learn that. So, you know, I, you've made me feel a lot better about myself, Andy. That's oh great. well, okay. <laughs> Yeah. It was truly, truly terrible. Uh, uh, but, it, it, but I know what you mean. Um, and for the listener, I, we'll talk about Alexville when we get on to your sort of, fir- I guess, your first serious band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's the first thing. Well, maybe we should move on. Maybe let's move on to that now. So you've done you've done Just Weeks. What was it? <laughs> no, just, no, no, you've seen Just Fakes. So here's the band order. Jazz 3. <laughs> right. Jazz yeah. 3. Then it well, went Swarm. Swarm, which Swarm. became Xenophobia. Not to be confused with xenophobia. Xenophobia Zem- is the fear of the great mold rat. Okay, so that was like right. form V2. Uh, we kind right. of grew into that. Then after that, I did a band for a while with a good friend of mine called Gavin Leeson uh, called With Regards, which was a sort of arty, post-punky thing we did at school. Right. And from With Regards, I joined the operation. Yeah. So I'm guessing that With Regards, because you've given it an actual genre, a genre which is has some sophistication to it. Yeah. Um, you knew what you were doing at this point. You sort of almost figured it out. No, we wanted to pre- look like we knew what we were doing. You know, we, right. we were still very much, at that time we were listening to a, a lot of stuff like Refused and Glassjaw, you know, so like uber seri- like serious music, you know, big boy music. Um, yeah. And we were trying to ape that style. I found an old live recording. We did a, a live gig in Trobish Park on the bandstand. And uh, yeah. I found this tape, and it's actually it's actually pretty good, you know. Um, but and we, but that was the first band where it's kind of like, right, what do we look like? What do we sound like? Right. You had some sort of idea of how the the mechanisms of the of the industry worked a bit. Yeah, and just how bands bands need to present themselves as well. You know, that's I think yeah. that's a big learning, another learning curve. It, it, that is really super important. I, I look back to a, to some images of. Uh, uh, the band that are kind of formed after Scream 92, which is called Rejected Faith, where I, I thought we knew 
that stuff mm. in our heads. And I looked, I saw some pictures the other day and I looked at it and I thought, we thought we knew so much, but we we really weren't putting an awful lot of it into practice. Or if we were, it was just not quite up to scratch. I think a lot of the time that strong image thing isn't isn't necessarily the band's creation. And it's difficult as well when you're in your mid-teens to do that convincingly, you know, I think. Yeah, because you don't know who you are, let alone exactly and what this whole thing is yeah and I, it's the same even with the operation a much more serious band with with ac- actual stuff going on for us and i look back at some photos and we, we look like kids you know we look like kids having a good time playing guitar and what we thought we should dress like and we didn't always get it right we did t- yeah. more towards the end but you know you can't blame teenagers for for not getting everything on the money 100 percent. you know but that's part of it isn't it yeah you know, that's what these early bands are for is that you, uh, you you figure out as you go on, it's trial and error. Mm. I do want to point out that we, we mentioned Joel Pete um, mm. with the Just Fakes thing that you said that you saw and you inspired you to start a proper band because um, I don't know if it will come back up. But mm-hmm. Joel Pete, who is um, he's a good friend of mine and a good friend of yours yeah. still, went on to be in a band called More Than Life who basically invented a subgenre of hardcore punk called Melodic Hardcore along with... Um, Oh, what was that band in the states? The uh, you had that uh, modern life is war. Well, uh, there's America. Well, there's that band, but American Nightmare. There's a whole whole um, movement of bands. I'd, I'd uh, they did the definitely spearheaded the UK version yeah. movement of that. Um, but very importantly, as well as this conversation prior to Modern Life, Joel played in Basics, which is a hugely influential band locally and in the UK to definitely to me as well. You know, when you're a teenager, you, I remember getting the base six CD and I was like, that was so cool. Cause that was the first time people I knew had made music that you could buy or that you could own right. a piece of. And I was like, I mean, that's yeah. that, that feeling of, you know, when you get that box of CDs and you open it up, you know, of your band or you buy your friend's band CD for the first time, it's like, fuck, it's not just, it's not just a, hobby or it's not just a pipe dream it's a, yeah. it's a real thing and that that to me was a really influential point as well yeah you can listen to it forever like the music exists forever now yeah it's not just played 10 times while they're a band for a few months in the local youth no. club and then it's gone forever yeah. it's like actually a thing now and they're, and they're doing really it appreciated and they're doing it themselves it's not a record yeah. label it's it's they've they've done the art with themselves they've printed the cds with the stickers on they've put them into the sleeves they've sold them to their friends for three four five pounds or whatever it is and they're doing gigs and people are going and that to yeah. me was hugely exciting and hugely in, yeah. um, influential as well that's amazing yeah i love that um, that's a bit of my blind spot though because i just wasn't at the right age there yeah. to be aware of the local scene and be going out to gigs yeah when you guys formed the operation mm-hmm. that was when i kind of sprang on to the to the scene that's why i reached that age where you know i could go off on my own for the evening downtown or whatever and you know the older you get as a as a young teenager you start getting let off the leash a little bit more and more and more, more, more and that was kind of that was where i was at it, when you guys formed operation and when joel had moved on and done more than life mm. you, like you said you're never satisfied with something no and you keep going you keep and you keep going i personally would feel very good if i if i was at the the level that that joel's been at where you know more than life haven't done anything for the probably the better part of 10 years at this point mm. yeah you know they still have very healthy streaming stats and i'm sure if they release merch it would sell out do you know what i mean it's the, the people haven't forgotten about them yeah definitely still enjoyed and i think that's a really good place to be in and you kind of wonder don't you stuff like that it's like does it stay at that level or does it grow like if we're talking about something like a shared love of ours like the misfits you know mm. at the time they were probably a bit like a more than life you know as in yeah. that level where they were doing everything themselves but people would come and see them they but they didn't really get that career you know quote unquote career out of their music until like 20 years later when metallica started doing covers i wonder whether when there was an appetite for it i wonder whether there's a a point where a band will cover more than life and it you know it becomes a, a huge thing and then joe has to like <laughs> Dust off his Reform. skinny jeans and do you know what I mean? Get out there and and, and and do it. Get his tattoos touched up and gone and die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Misfits definitely weren't in the punk rock world a household name, were they? Until, but the the nineties thing is interesting as well. Mm. But yeah, I that I do feel I find that um, 
that they've obviously left it in a good place. And I've spoken to Joel a few times about more than life reunions and the kind of money that would be having to be put on the table for it and where it would go and yeah. where they would do it and stuff. And I'm I'm not going to put that out onto the podcast because it's not my... You know, Bill's like super punk, isn't he? He's like, oh, it would be about the money, but, you know, he would. He'd do it for... <laughs> no, but, but some, of the, some of the money we've talked about, it, yeah. would, um, it would buy a new... Harley for and Harley, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and why not, you know, put yeah. the effort in. But they, I've spoke to him a few times about the ending of that career and it was basically, mm-hmm. they could have gone pro easily. Mm-hmm. And it was like, they said, you know what, um, if we do this, it's just going to get boring and, and, and the, the adventure of it is going to go. It will just become, and that's the most punk rock thing you can do, isn't it? It's just walk away when you've got to that thing and not be controlled. Yeah, but maybe you've had that experience, you know, those tours, they're not easy. They're not, no. you know, it's not a, they're not on like a huge bus with, with their families in tow. You know, you've got, especially with that genre of music, you're going to be going and going and going for a long time without your, the little comforts that become more important as you get older, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, it's fun, isn't it? The first time you go out and you sleep on the floor and you're in a van, that's great. But, you know, you're doing that eight, nine times a year. By the third year, you probably want you know a bit of time out. Yeah, I mean, when when COVID came in uh, last year, twenty twenty, and it's basically put four sick ones onto uh, onto like a hiatus. It was bittersweet, but it we you know we'd been living it for four years. Yeah, really, and really hard, and you know, because you were there for many of the shows, and you've seen mm-hmm. it, and, and and you've done the same thing yourself mm-hmm. when you live and you breathe it, and then suddenly someone's like, well, this is going to be a year off and there's not nothing you can do about it. There's part of you that's like, well... Do you think it's a good thing, though, having that year? Don't know. Don't know. I, I'm doing some new music with Charlie at the moment. And yeah. James Porter, who does who drums for 10 tons. Who was, oh, he was on, the, he was on mm. the podcast in season one. I'm doing some music with them at the moment, and it's great, and I, and I am enjoying it, and it's cool, and it's new to us. Yeah. Uh, and everything but um you know but it did make me think about all the things i'd done with sick ones and appreciate and i sort of sometimes i think oh i wish i'd lived in the moment a little Mm -hmm. more because things like european tours and touring with dead kennedys and going to america and being on the radio and everything and they're really cool but like you were saying your conversation with alex veal is it's always like oh what next yeah you don't stop and enjoy it do you You what's the next thing yeah. I do remember yeah. there was a, a point with the operation. It's a, a very, it's seared into my memory. We were, we'd done one of our trips to the States and we were flying out of, of Los Angeles and the, the, the plane has to go out over the sea and, and sort of bank round to go back towards the UK. And I remember looking out the window and I'd seen this a few times before, you know, this, this, this scenery below me. And I, weirdly, on the last time we, we were leaving, I was like, this could be the last time. I see this, and it was one of the yeah. one of the times I did live in the moment a little bit, you know. And there's, yeah. there's been other times where you're doing something really cool, and you're like, "Oh wow, this is great," or "This is scary," or "This is, you know, nerve wracking." But it's very rare, like you say, that you get that at that precise moment in time. It's like almost like a photograph, you know, like a snapshot yeah. of that time. And and yeah. I, th- I think, yeah, maybe something from COVID I've learned is is hi- you know that hindsight looking back on stuff, and hopefully when we get out of this situation, which we will, we'll all appreciate those things a bit more, you know, the mm. the, li- the little things and the, and the big things, not just be constantly on the go and, and onto the next yeah. thing. And, and a lot of that is ambition. Mm. And it's being young, ambitious yeah. and full of piss and vinegar and, <laughs> and, and wanting it uh, and being hungry. And, uh, but then some of it is also, you know, I remember when we were, we were just leaving Virginia or New Jersey, one of the two. And Charlie pipes up in the back seat and he says, uh, "Oh, hey, we've I just had this email from such and such, blankety blank. I'm not going to say who it was, but fa- a fairly big fish music yeah. industry guy uh, wants you to uh, wants to know if we want to uh, if we want to play House of Vans opening up for Cancer Bats. That's we'll cool. Back. Yeah. And it's cool, but then but but that's then the next thing. Like, yeah, book it in." Yeah, and so and so you're not you are in that moment. You're in a and I tried to with America because it was something I didn't think would happen, but yet something I always mm. 
on a good day thought would happen, if you know what I mean. It's a strange one, isn't it? You yeah. can say, oh, yeah, we're going to do it. We're going to we're gonna get there. I'm going to do this. And then when it actually happens, there's a part of you that goes, yeah, but there is a part of you that didn't think this would ever happen. But don't you think there's the, the other weird thing? And, you know, we, we've both been fortunate enough to have those kind of adventures through music, you know. Mm. Um, but the contrast, you know, I remember being, again, when we were doing our trips to America, that morning, I think I was on Venice Beach, and then that evening, I was at home in Froome, and the next day I had to do a shift at my weekend job, and the contrast yeah. was just so alarming to me because yeah. how does your brain process that? You know, there's so yeah. much so much technology involved to get you from, you know, Venice Beach to Froome within 24 hours, but also to adjust to that and switch gears back from being, you know, trying to pretend you're a rock star or whatever to being <laughs> being you know the, the saturday boy at a furniture shop is yeah. you know that's that that must do something to you somewhere yeah i remember um coming back from america for a bit it was mm. like to a degree it was almost like i remember i sort of go to the pub i had a bit of time off after that yeah. still to to sort of calibrate again but being in the pub after it and people haven't seen the updates throughout the, the week and some yeah. things I'd done had gone sort of locally viral, just like pissing around on mobility scooters in Walmart and stuff. <laughs> locally like. viral. It makes you sound like some sort of like local gigolo. <laughs> 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 oh, I've gone locally yeah. viral. You want to get checked local. out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and people were like, hey man, you know, and it felt like this strange, like you know, people would say stuff to me like, oh, you know, like we, you make us really proud. Mm. And that so, and it was like a big deal to some people, like that I didn't really think would think it was a big deal, or didn't really know me that well, but took great pride in the fact that some people had gone out to America and done some stuff, and and it was very strange. But yeah, it was it's weird. You just don't in the moment, and I mm. think because if you allow yourself to take the moment in, to a degree, I think you make yourself vulnerable to the idea of failure. Yeah, but because you think, oh, I better look, at, I better take this in because this might not be this might not ever happen again, or this might be the end of the road after this. Mm. And there's a part of you that goes, no, we can't think like that. We have to think about the next thing now. But don't you think as well as that sort of, like you said, the pride and, and, and making yourself vulnerable to, to failure, but I'm trying, I'm trying to, as I get older, be less concerned about, for example, musical output. Not that I don't want my stuff to be good, but not be so like, Oh, I can only, that song isn't good enough. You know, I think there's also an argument for just doing things, putting things out there, keep going, because if you worry about it all too much, you wouldn't ever do anything, you know? And that's the lesson I'm trying to learn as I get older is actually just be, just do stuff, be productive. You know, yeah. not, not everything's going to be a hit. Not everything's going to be as good as your last album, but that doesn't matter. And all the, if you look at all the really successful artists and, you know, painters, artists, I mean, as well as musicians, all the ones that are hugely successful have a large body of work, you know, and yeah. some stuff you wouldn't even have known about, you know, you think about all yeah. the stuff like Elvis recorded, you know, yeah. for every Elvis song that I know, I can probably name, I'm not going to, but you know, probably name you like 10 to 20. There's like 40 other recordings of those songs or and it's just, and they're all there. You can, you can find them all if you look hard enough, but it's just being prolific and keeping on going and, re and honing your craft, you know, and I think that's really yeah. important. So we've talked a bit about, we've alluded to the operation. Now, for me personally, and I forget this sometimes as I get older and stuff, as you say, you forgot things when you saw just fakes and whatnot. Mm. Uh, operation, to me, were a big band. And I still listen. I still listen to you guys. Thanks, man. We're a big band locally. And they, because you were very active at the time when I was going out to gigs mm. very, for the first time, Obviously, it holds a. I got beard beard in my mouth. Sorry, holds a. Um, get that out of the way. Uh, <laughs> a, a special place in one's heart. Yeah. But it was also that the songs were great. Your stage presence was professional. You all had professional gear, instruments. The way you carried yourself was professional. The way you did your press was professional. Mm -hmm. Everything you did, I thought, was the benchmark of how a, a local band, and I know you guys were branching out nationally and with the, the trips to the US, which we will get more into in a moment. Mm -hmm. I thought everything you guys were doing, I was taking cues from that. And it still does, to a degree, inform my quality control whether or not it's a present thought of the operation or if it's just now what I know to be mm. 
a quality control thing. And you have the same ethos with Ghost of the Avalanche, which came after mm -hmm. the operation, um, and now with Meadow Burials, which is, you know, sonically rough around the edges by design, yeah. but the way that everything else operates, artwork, posts, um, social media, everything, is done with that professional informed edge to it so tell me about the operation when you formed the operation with alex veal who is now of tax the heat fame yeah which i guess we'll get on to i'd like to get alex on the podcast you should yeah he'd point. be good he's good at remembering yeah. stuff as well so, yeah. Yeah. yeah he has the memory i actually um, told him i told him i said so i'm going on andy's show and i need some key dates from you because i i can't remember <laughs> shit you know i can't so i've actually got a notepad here with some key dates written in them like a you prepared. It's a geriatric thing going on here. Like, you know, <laughs> Nineteen forty-six is the year. I... <laughs> and don't forget, Nick, your mum's birthday is on Thursday. You might want to get her some flowers. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So the operation when you guys yeah. formed, were you like, okay, this is how we're going to do it? Um, actually, I I I walked into the operation. I wasn't their first bass player. So um, how that happened, I think. I think, and you would probably need Al to clarify some of this, but from my hazy memory, I was good friends with a girl at school who I believe was dating or had dated the operation's original bass player, a guy called Guy. And they'd been going about a year and I got wind f through her that he was thinking of leaving or was about to leave or something. So I didn't know Alex um, at all. I knew Greg Freeman, the original drummer, through uh, you know the the Just Fakes connection and through school, and but he was you know a year older than me, and at school that's a big difference, you know, when you're mm -hmm. <laughs> when you're those age. So I wasn't really friendly with him, but I you know maybe I could say hi to him in the practice room, that kind of thing. So anyway, I got wind that their original bass player was leaving, and I I had to audition for the part, uh, and that again, like you were saying about that sort of level of professionalism, it wasn't just like they knew I had a bass guitar and got me, and I had to the audition and I believe there were other people that auditioned as well so um <laughs> or I was led to believe that other people auditioned but anyway I got that but I remember having a conversation with Alex on the phone like I'd never spoke to the guy before and we were talking about you know what influences I had what music I liked um before the before the audition you know so to speak so we had a long chat and then I literally rocked up at Southwick Village Hall with a, a bass amp and a bass and and went went for it and that was the start of it so I didn't Again, the approach to that band, it wasn't like we were friends who enjoyed playing music together initially. You know, we were we were all driven to do something properly. Yeah. Right. Which is very different, yeah. isn't it, to the just playing music with your friends from school. You know, it's yeah. it's got a different intent. Um Well it's a working relationship. Yeah. First yeah. and foremost. And then everything else comes after yeah, that. Yeah, and that's important. To, you know, everything else did come after and you know, and I you know, I consider Alex like my best friend, you know, and we've had so many experiences together now. And I was, I was his best man at his wedding. He is my best man. So from music, again, from music, we've, this thing has come forward, which may not have done if I hadn't got into music. And incidentally, I did speak to Alex before that, um, which he will remind me of from time to time that he sold me my first ever bass amp when he worked in Stag Music in Trowbridge. And it was a piece of shit. <laughs> and he knew it he knew it and then um, and but interesting we actually used that amp to record vo or rehearse vocals with it at one point so it kind of came back into the fold so yeah it was it was um i i auditioned got the part uh, but walking into the operation was a weird one because it was already established it'd been going a year or so and so i felt like a the new guy which i was i was also the youngest um the band already had a manager which was crazy to me and to my mind you know this band's got a That's manager crazy to my mind now yeah 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 exactly <laughs> but um and they you know there's rumors that they had label interests so it was all stuff i wanted you know it was all things i wanted to be involved with and that's that's really the main the main reason i joined that band is because i thought they were a band going somewhere and i wanted to be part of that adventure so and it paid off in terms of having those adventures i think that's the only reason to join any band yeah but you Especially know at my age but, but, our age yeah, now. yeah more your age yeah no um you got but, prospects yeah, yeah. <laughs> just one more time betty i'll get back on the bus one more time <laughs> but, um yeah so uh but yeah i think that's important to know is that you know that band i joined that band not it wasn't a organic thing it was a, an established thing i already I, I came into the fold and i had to try and establish myself within you know as a young young man you know i was 17 when i joined so very different you know 
person to a, as I am now. As, as as were Alex and Greg, they were very different people, and mm. and we definitely learned a lot together. But we're also very, we're also extremely self critical on ourselves, and I think that's still the case to this day in some respects. You know, I think if I want something checked in terms of music, as is this any good? Alex is my go to guy. You know, he might not necessarily like the genre I'm writing in or putting out but i trust his opinion and i think that's mm. and that that level of trust and reliance on each other and that was def- definitely something from the operation where we were we were our own worst enemy in terms of being so self-critical to the point where if we had a bad gig you know i remember gigs which we thought were terrible you know but again the audience thought it was great you know but we as band give us such a hard time they always do they yeah. always do say oh yeah it was great mate yeah. it was so sick and you think oh, i i fucked yeah. that song up yeah but to the point where we <laughs> give each other a hard time about it it's like you fucked that song right. up or oh you didn't you forgot that bit or your harmony was off or you know yeah that's the level we would at in terms of trying to hone our craft which oh, is, yeah yeah which is looking back is that's harsh man that's really it's really harsh well it, well, it is <laughs> but it's like you know do you want or do you want to be the best you can be yeah. You know, I don't but internally conversations with sick ones post show where yeah you know Charlie said stuff like we just need to be better <laughs> <laughs> you know and yeah. it's like you know it, it, but it's never you know I have found myself a few times thinking oh, for God's sake like when is this punk rock when is this you know, yeah. supposed to be punk rock and you know the, are we enjoying it more that, uh, as much as we can but then you, you just take take your ego out of it for a second yeah and think about it and you go no 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 it's no no correct it's correct let's let's try and do a little better this time doing punk rock well is the least punk rock thing you can do do you know what I mean? yeah. and, but I, I don't mean that in a but that's what I'm saying like Jazz Stream is the most punk band I've ever done <laughs> you know whereas something like you listen to something like um, you know a really good hardcore punk band, something like the Bronx they they can play really well the singer's the great singer the drummer's the best rock drummer you've ever heard and you know, that's what especially with punk that's what you kind of are aspiring to isn't it which is kind of not very punk it's, it's a really weird catch 22 sort of thing but but yeah with the operation we, obviously we weren't a punk band with the operation but for all intents and purposes, a lot of what we did was DIY, was off our own back. Like you're saying, like the the press releases, the songwriting, the artwork, it was all, we didn't have a team. That was us, you know, doing that, but doing it as the best we possibly could with what we had around us, you know? So yeah. people, you know, say, think it's really odd now that I play in punk bands and I listen to that punk, like punk music. It's like, no, to me, in my mind, the, the operation was a punk band, you know, stylistically, maybe not so much on, some songs were, but not so much most of it. But you know, the attitude to getting things done and doing it yourself and making it as best it possibly can be—that's yeah. that's the attitude that, to me, that's punk. You know, and yeah. So I don't think it's a massive leap to see the operation to what I do now in terms of Ghost of Avalanche or Manic Burials. Is a lot of the lessons I learned during the operation have definitely carried over. You know, and looking back on it now, if I saw a ba- if I saw the operation now as you were when I was. 14, 15, mm-hmm. I would say their parents have got some money or <laughs> or um, I would say that um, their mum or uncle works in the industry mm-hmm. or they're being sculpted by some adult force somewhere. Now, I'm not trying to diminish what mm-hmm. you guys achieved, but you definitely seem to have more savvy than any band your age I've seen mm-hmm. ever or since um where did that come from is that just being so hyper focused on it so part of that is is true what you said so we were very fortunate and it may have been by design i'm not sure but maybe on alex's part i don't know but so you get greg freeman being involved in the band who who is now a very successful producer he was cutting his teeth recording the operation he was in a position where he had a little home setup so we were able to effectively do our own demos so mm-hmm. yeah, compared to other bands, perhaps we had a slight advantage there. But he was that was his craft. He was he was refining. Um, in terms of um, an adult sphere, we had that manager I was talking to you about who did work in the industry, but not to a level where it would have helped us in a monetary sense. So uh, he was right. a, a tour manager of some some bands, and the operation was like his pet project, I guess. For yeah. um, so we but we so yeah we did have a steer. We had a bit of guidance yeah not not in a monetary sense but we definitely had guidance and and through his connections we may have 
been able to access, you know, I'll oh, chat to this studio engineer who wants to try something out. You know, so we had little ins. But, but that's the same yeah. for any band that keep, you know, most bands will have, if they keep going and they're good enough, we'll find a little... yeah. A little way in somewhere, um, but it's not dirty. It's you know, it's just the way it works. It's about who you know. But in a monetary sense, you know, we 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 all we were we were not rich kids. You know, we I you know I'd save up for my instruments. You know, get a bit of help from my folks, I guess. But it wasn't like a mummy and daddy bought me this Marshall Stack situation. You know, we, yeah, yeah. We and and I I still play the same guitars now that i had i know, that band, I, you, know? I, you, you put a throwback up the other day <laughs> yeah. you, with with your uh your fringe and everything playing bass mm. on stage and i was looked at that bass and i was like he's still playing that fucking bass yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's a great bass but i remember i saved up for months in, you know weekend jobs and yeah a bit of support from my folks and it's it's but i think in in terms of the career wise thing we we weren't wealthy kids who just had a a, a, a bank no, you weren't all the, the gear, and no idea. No. I've seen this before, and I'm sure you have. You yeah. show up to the show, and whoever's opening up for you, or someone's in the middle of the the bill above you, and you want, you know, they play, and you think, I don't know why we opened for that, but okay. And they've got all the nicest shit, no technique. They're horrible. They don't know how to communicate with your, you know, their stage presence sucks, and you think what. How have you got this like pearl whatever kit, with <laughs> yeah. thousand pound symbols on it? And then you and find out their dad's like I don't know Phil Collins or something. <laughs> 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 right. so. That's not to demean Phil Collins or his, any of his no. children. I'm sure they're lovely people. But it, I've been point, listening to Phil Collins all week, by the way. No jacket required, mate. <laughs> Weird that you should say it. But uh, yeah. um, uh, I could digress. I'll send you a link to it later. I saw a documentary about Phil Collins yet last night on I YouTube. Love Phil Collins. The, the, the farewell yeah. tour thing. Oh yeah, and yeah. and it's Spinal Tap. Is it's it? Spinal Tap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a moment where he's with his press officers and they have to do the t- the tour is running out. Of, uh, it's mm. losing money. Um, and there's a moment where he has to do this thing where he says to someone, "I will go back to this country mm. and do a couple of dates for." a donation to my charity, my oh, foundation. Cool. Mm. And then what he does is he gives 80% of it to the charity mm. and then he takes 20% of it, which puts him back in the red for yeah. the tour. Uh, not the red, the black for the tour. Yeah. And But the charity gets, um, it was two million, wow. the donation for the show. So the charity is getting an awful lot of money. So mm. it's not like you watch it and you go, you're taking money from charity. It's yeah. like, no, if you didn't do that, that charity wouldn't have seen any of that money. So, I back it. But anyway, he does the whole thing with the big check and there's all the press mm-hmm. there and the, the, the cameras are going and everything. <laughs> the big check. <laughs> the big the big comedy yeah. check. Imagine right. trying to cash that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just <laughs> he's yeah. And and um and they go to leave and um the press woman is like, Oh no, they've locked us in <laughs> and <laughs> And they're trying to they're trying to leave the press conference with this massive check. And and the door's locked and they're trying to open it. <laughs> you can see Phil that, looking that, around. I, I went and saw a, a band in Bristol recently, uh, Parquet Courts. I say recently, right. it's probably like two years ago now. But um <laughs> they they left the stage really great game. Good night, everyone, you know, thank you. Went, wow, yeah. And then we went outside to have a beer. And out the back, behind the venue, I could see them all stood there. I was like, oh, it's the band. I was like, I want to just go and say, you know, great set, guys. And they're like really awkward about it. And I was like, oh, I don't want to be that that fanboy. But I realised yeah. it's because they'd locked themselves out of the venue. They couldn't get back in. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone was leaving get to get into their cars to drive off. Yeah. But, and they couldn't get back into the venue. So they're trying to like <laughs> look really nonchalant and cool. <laughs> but it was just because they couldn't get back in. <laughs> But sorry, the other thing I wanted to say as well um, was you were talking about, um, you know, you, you you thought we were savvy um, and, and I made a comment about the operation being a, a punk band. You kind of think maybe, well, why was, was I in the band? But I think one of the things that was really important is, like you said, the songs are really good. Yeah. And, and I think ultimately above anything else, above what we looked like, any opportunities we had, the thing that, and I know for a fact, the thing that got us some of these great opportunity experiences were because the songs were so good. I can back that up because oh yeah, before MySpace was a thing way back when, you know, something AD, there was um, a, a website called Bright Skies. I think that's the right name, brightskies.com, which was kind of a precursor to MySpace, but it was locally based in the Bristol Southwest area. 
and we uploaded a couple of our tunes to that to that site and a guy in america heard those so a guy that uh, a manager in america who specialized in breaking international acts into america heard right. our tunes and because they had that american pop rock sensibility he latched they were onto very it. rock radio weren't they? yeah yeah totally and then he was looking yeah. for that kind of band so the the songs were what it wasn't an industry connection it was the songs that got us the yeah the the uh, foot in the door with the with the stage, which is ultimately some of the biggest stuff we did was was through that. So and that was all because of a, a tune we posted on the precursor to MySpace. So was that in the dust? No, this was prior to that. I think it would have been either eleven fifty eight Monday or potentially even something a track we did before that, which was called Spin the World. I think it might have been Spin the World actually. Okay, which you probably don't have a copy of. I can get a bit nerdy about the operation, and, and, and I'm, I'll try not to. But yeah, I, like I said, you know, I said you had some savvy, some this, some that. But in mm. no way was I trying to take away from the fact that you guys were fucking great. What you did? <laughs> no, I didn't take it like that. Mm. So you get the operation. You do this, all this stuff locally. You put out uh, two EPs, and then two mm. albums or three albums. What was it now? Uh, oh, you, uh, we, we San Giuliano few- EP. Yeah, so we did a few promos before that, just you know what, what our wares that we've been doing in demo mode. But um, so we had a couple of like unofficially promo EPs. But yeah, the first proper, actually, the first proper EP was probably the eleven fifty eight Monday EP, which is a three track sampler. But then we did, uh, yeah, the San Giuliano EP, which is the bright yellow covered one. Uh, then two albums, Beautiful Days and Human Zoo, and then we ex- uh, imploded. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I have all three of them, and I have I have a beautiful days which is actually signed by all of you guys. Oh, but cool. it wasn't, but I didn't get it signed because I even even back then I was like, I need to play this cool. Mm. So I didn't do it when all my friends wanted you guys to sign their shit. I was like, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I felt so bad once. I I wrote. I used to write. You know, you had to have to like. You know, it sounds massively wrong but it, i don't mean it this way people would come and ask us when you used to sell cds at shows a lot of the time people would come and ask you to sign them which is lovely and it, it, you know we're really grateful for that but you'd get on a bit of a conveyor belt sometimes it's like to andy you know and i i was just always not really know what to write so it's more of so i used to write you rock you know to andy you rock nick you know yeah cool um but i used to write my handwriting is terrible and i used to write that so often i remember i remember I used to I used to hand it to, to a drummer at the time when this happened. It was uh, Ollie Court, and I remember handing him. We were at a festival somewhere, in like Pusey or somewhere random, and um, I handed him a CD to sign. This girl had asked me to sign, so I put you know to uh, sake of example, Emma, you rock, Nick, and I passed that to Ollie, and I looked down at it, and it looked like I'd written to Emma, you cock, <laughs> <laughs> because my R became a C, and he just looked right. like you can't write that. I was like, I didn't mean to. So there's probably lots of. <laughs> There's probably lots of CDs, operation CDs out there with to somebody you cock you written can't. on them. I'll, but, I'll but check not intentionally. Mine later. Yeah. No, yours I'll definitely look. has to Andy you cock written on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually found that in a boot sale. Oh, mate. Hey, you're taking it down the page, aren't you? Great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, and I, I was like, you know what, 50p? <laughs> That's what it's come like, to. You, you take twenty pence for that, mate. You went, yeah, all right. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. But, I still um, get, I still get sent photos of people that have found Operation CDs in, like, you know, um, Dorothy House or whatever in Oxfam. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, great. At least, at least they're still out there. People are. No, I, know. I like that. I think that's yeah. a good thing. You know, um, how does America come about for you? Because you end up being, you're looking at a, a, a fairly good deal, aren't you, at the time? And then it falls apart with mm. the, the music industry collapse in yeah. 2000. 2008 is that right the great the great crash of 2000 how does that come about so i'm not talking into the mic so yeah as, come so, about? Well, as i said the, the whole bright skies thing was the the kickoff for that so uploading right. our tunes to the site so this american manager um got in contact with our uk manager at the time was like i really want to get the guys over here and play in front of some labels because i think um they go down well um so we were flown that out to the states, so the labels. This is back in the day where record labels would pay you to do do stuff like this. So they gave us some money to pay for our flights, and I actually, I actually got paid to be there. I had a, an allowance every day to spend on whatever I wanted to, which is really is that bad. A when per you're, diem. Yeah, a per diem. I had a per diem. I've never had one. <laughs> it was weird when you're when you're eighteen, seventeen, eighteen, having a per diem in America is not a good thing. 
Um, right, so, uh, how much was your per diem? Oh, no, well, we got to think about inflation, Andy. So it, today's money would have been about £3,000. No, it was, um, I think it was $30 a day I had, you know, to spend okay. on whatever I wanted to. And cause Which I, is what now? 50 quid? Yeah, something like that. I don't know. Right. So it was enough for my, my beer and any anything else. And, and, you know, I didn't have anything to spend it on other than beer and food. So I was just hammered the entire time, I think. Um <laughs> But um, yeah, so that was cool, and we had a um, a lot of interest from major labels. Uh, I think I can say now a couple. I think Sony was one of the the big ones. Um, and it was really weird because we you don't think you know. Yeah, I tried to. You sort don't of... forget when Sony. <laughs> no, no, mate, right, it's all right. Own it. You know. Yeah. I think Sony was maybe one. No, Sony was interested in you. Yeah. Mate. Own it. And and I can say the guy <laughs> who signed Disturbed was really into the operation. So um, <laughs> oh, that's great. yeah. So. Um, yeah, weren't they Roadrunner though? Are they not Roadrunner? Uh, maybe, yes. maybe I don't know what the the relationship is between Roadrunner and Sony, but um, yeah. Anyway, the guy maybe he worked for Roadrunner before, and then went, so this guy um, was really into us, and I remember being sat in his office, and they did the whole thing where they played played your music over the tannoy in Sony's offices, you know, um, and it was like, oh, you guys, um, you're great. I want to sign you to the label. Uh, we even signed like a like a pre contract contract to say we wouldn't talk to anyone else. And the next step was we were meant to go to New York. So we were in Los Angeles at this point and we played some shows and it had gone really well. We really want to sign you guys, but I need you to play for my bosses. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm middle management. I need you to play for my bosses um, in, in New York. So we, the idea was we were going to fly because we had return flights booked. We were meant to fly home to the UK, spend a week or two at home in the UK, then go back out to New York to sort of seal the deal, as it were. Uh, we flew back to the UK, week went past, no news second week went past no news our manager in the states was frantically trying to get hold of this guy turns out he'd been made redundant in the two weeks that we'd uh <laughs> <laughs> flown back so um but you know it, so then we, we were trying to pick up the, the 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 momentum again um with the label because the industry at the time was changing so much they put the brakes on everything literally everything and then um, they weren't signing new bands they weren't taking risks on new bands anymore um and and we will know where that goes so that was kind of the end of that era of big labels taking risks on new bands. And every and we went out subsequently a few more times, I think like four or five times even, to to do more work and do some TV shows and stuff um, and to try and keep the interest going. But every time I went back, it was just kind of like the the offices had downsized, you know, the <laughs> PDNs weren't there. The, uh, <laughs> you know, my red M&Ms weren't in the right bowl, you know. It just everything had got a little bit... <laughs> It was just, you know what I mean, I'm joking, but it kind of, yeah. everything seems to be winding down. Scaling back. In that sense. Cutting. Yeah, scaling back. So um, so after a while, I think it just, for us anyway, because we were, like we were saying earlier, we were just going at it and trying, and we were doing everything we could. It just felt like everything around us wasn't putting in the same effort or trying as hard, yeah. you know. And and I think ultimately we, we, we burnt out on that, you know. Um, oh, how could you not? I, I, I think about your situation more than I should <laughs> with, with that operation thing it, it, it is that I don't like, I mean, I sort of feel like I've been not where you are, but I've been to a similar place where I felt we were on the edge of a next level. You feel it, don't you? Thing. You feel like there's yeah. that, it's a bit like being, a, I guess like a surfer in the wave and you just need, you just need to drop in and just need that, that extra thing. Yeah. And then something doesn't go right. And you worry about whether that will be something that keeps you up for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, yeah, yeah. And, and sometimes I think about you guys and, and all the potential that was there and just how next level that was, even to the stuff that I experienced. Mm. And and how do you, because it didn't happen for you guys, spoiler alert, it didn't happen for the operation <laughs> in the way it was about to. Or happen, you could say right? it hasn't happened yet, maybe. <laughs> or it hasn't happened yet. Well, hey, hey, hey. well, I hope, I really hope. Yeah. But um, how did you deal with that? Because that's just, you've done everything you can. You've been the best you can be. You've put yourselves under so much pressure. You've held yourself to such a high level that Sony come along and say, look, you guys are great. Mm. Come play LA two, three times. Yeah. Um, go to New York, play for my guys. This is great. This mm. is going to happen. Here's a here's a contract. Blah blah blah. You know they probably blow all kinds of smoke up your ass as well. With we're going to get you on the the radio. Oh yeah, we're gonna do yeah, this. Yeah. We're going to start that and all that shit. Mm. Um, 
all your dreams are coming true. You're probably already resigning from your job spank over <laughs> yeah. your head, right? Screw you guys. <laughs> hey, I'm out. I'm <laughs> yeah. out. You know. Yeah. Hey, that you remember that time you asked me to come in on a Sunday morning? Yeah, fuck you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, and it doesn't happen. You must be crestfallen. Are you asking me how do I sleep at night? <laughs> how do you sleep at night, Nick Wilkins? Knowing that. No, how um, do you sleep at night? Um, I mean, I'm sure you're over it now, but that would probably still bother me to this day. Sometimes it would, I think it would irk me. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd, look, I'd be lying if I said it didn't frustrate me or it didn't, you know, it def- definitely frustrated me at the time and, and I know it frustrated the rest of the band and then anyone involved with the band. And like you said, people who were in your corner, you know, people you'd see in the pub really wanted it to happen for you. So, yeah. you know, it is frustrating. But, you know, I I look at it in two ways. It's, I think if it had happened, you know, bearing in mind I was 18, 19, whatever at this time, would that have been a good thing would that have been a healthy thing for me yes you know yes i don't yes. know if i i look yes. at what i have now <laughs> yeah um you know i look at I look at, and maybe this is how i deal with it i don't know but maybe you know there's um i, I think about the experiences i had that i was i was a very fortunate to have those experiences anyway you know yeah um i think about the friendships that i formed during those times i think about the things i've learned from those experiences and how they they influence my everyday life even now and even my job and how i approach projects or or creativity um which is all and that's really the funny thing is a lot of what i do in my adult life has been influenced or directly um affected by my time in music both positively and negatively you know a lot of the skills you learn i apply in daily you know design and 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 how to communicate with people how to write a press release where all that stuff is stuff i did because of the operation and and i now earn a living doing you know in my day job Mm. so it's a I, th- I think if it had happened, I might have had a really negative experience. Perhaps a you know an eighteen nineteen year old from Froome shouldn't be, you know, given the keys to the door in terms of what, as we all know, everything that you experience as a young man in the limelight. I don't know. I, it, you can, it's all ifs and buts, isn't it? But I think I definitely don't think about it in the way it doesn't. It doesn't keep me up at night. I think right. I'm still playing music. I'm still still doing stuff and again it goes back to that thing of every for every success someone has there's there's you know 20 not non non successful things that they've done to to get to a point you know and would i i'd like to do some of that stuff again uh, but it is nice to have those memories and um i'm very grateful to have had those experiences. and i'm also very grateful for my situation now because a lot of people come out of those experiences and do fall really hard and don't mm. recover from them and I mean, I know, and that sounds like, you know, first world problems, but it's the, <laughs> you know, I have heard stories of people that do go through experiences like that and they don't come out the other side very well. And, and ultimately, you know, in some exp- some people's experience, that's very extreme and they can't form relationships with people, they can't hold down a job. Um, and I think actually, if you look at everyone in the band at that time, we've all, we're all quite, you know, stable people. You know, we've all got mm-hmm. things going on in our personal life. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a big a big thing to think about, but ultimately, it's it's just a small a small thing in in the bigger adventure that we've had during that time. There's you know? not been any rock and roll tragedies, no. or casualties, not yet. No, you know, no, not yet. No. It's still time, and we're still friends, and that's the other thing. You know, I think if if yeah. we'd if we'd been um, maybe we had that success, maybe I wouldn't talk to Al now. You know, <laughs> perhaps <laughs> perhaps we would have fallen out yeah. about something, or you know. Well, e- egos go different yeah. ways under these sorts of things. Maybe our they? drummer oh. would have, you know, um, spontaneously combusted during Glastonbury. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's who knows. Yeah. Uh, or, or, yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. Who knows? And and you know, in a parallel universe. Oh man, I'm living it, the dream somewhere else, aren't I? It, it's, <laughs> it's there somewhere. Yeah. But um. But you know you're married now and you have a, uh, a beautiful daughter yeah. and so you know it's not you know. But, but and one of the other things that's crazy and it's a good thing to mention, I think, is that you know we did that reunion show, uh, 2019. So yeah, um, and we didn't know who would who would if anyone would care. You know, in my head, I imagined just playing to like. 30, 50 people tops. Do you know what I mean? People that yeah. were just sort of curious to see if we could still do it and. Yeah. And with the reason we did that is because it was 10 years after the first album had come out and um, almost 10 years since we played our last... Well, no, nine, eight years since we last played our last show. So it was a big deal for us as a band. And then we didn't know anyone else would care, but we wanted to do it. And actually, when we did do that show, I was 
hand on heart amazed at how many people cared that we did that show. You know, mm. we we you know, it sounds stupid to say, but we sold out the Weechies. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it was it was uh, it was. Um, yeah, I think it's a two. There's probably 150, 200 there. There was two hundred and forty tickets sold. So no, yeah, really, yeah, yeah, wow. So that was and I didn't that held that many. No, we we were surprised as well. But that was um, apparently the capacity. The we we sold it out. That's the only gig we ever sold out, and it was our, our reunion show in our hometown. <laughs> but you know that's cool, and and I'm so amazed. I'm still amazed. I still think about that gig, and and I will tell you, and I will tell you, that's probably the best gig we've ever done. You know, maybe not the best we'd ever played, or perhaps we played better. But for us, that was the best gig we'd ever done because it it, right. it felt right. It felt good and everyone there seems to be having a great time so, and that's what it's all about and so you the operation comes to an end mm. in, in what year is this look well, at your dates look at my notes. Notes. <laughs> i've got here last gig 2011 right yeah. ends in 2011 mm-hmm. uh and then i think 2015 mm. alex unveils tax the heat is it that late I thought... is it that it might be earlier it could be earlier the only reason i say that is because i released the first Ghost of the Avalanche mini album EP whatever in 2013 so he must so m- maybe that's when their first EP came I don't yeah know. I think there's some sort of parallel uh, in terms of release or new bands happening right. at that point yeah tell me about Empire do you want to talk about Empire I really like Empire but I know that you left Empire due to some sort of I, I, business I can tell decisions you, I, yeah, yeah no I can tell so Empire was a band I did uh, the operation stopped and I immediately went into Empire because of some of the other guys in Empire were from other bands we like um uh what they called Casino Drive. Casino Drive. Yeah. So good friends from playing shows with the operation and they 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 two of those guys decided to start new bands and they needed the bass player because they knew me. They they got in contact with me. Um and that was a cool experience for about a year because it was new new people to play with because I've been playing with the op for so long. I think I was in the op for like eight, nine years. So new bandmates and just trying something different, you know, um, different subgenre, I guess, of, of rock as the umbrella genre, but a subgenre of rock. Um, and we did a lot of gigs. It was kind of, I, th- I think really the reason I stopped doing Empire wasn't because I didn't, you know, I'd fallen out with anyone or didn't enjoy the music. It was because I was, I think, tired of playing Wednesday nights in, you know, Cheltenham or, uh, Farnborough or something like that and having to go to work next day and I was they were they were keen to do that maybe because they hadn't done as much as it much of it as I had to that point Mm. but I really you know I I couldn't do a day day's work hop in the van go four hours up the M4 to play a gig to you know 20 30 people and then drive back get home at five in the morning to be in work for seven do you know what I mean I could I couldn't stomach that at yeah. that point in time and i probably still can't to be fair so um <laughs> and they but they wanted to do that and i was like look after about a year i put a lot into that band i did a lot of the original artwork a lot of the, a lot of the songwriting and they were adamant on, on staying on that path and i said look best of luck to you guys i i, I i'm out you know i couldn't i couldn't hack that yeah. maybe um so and i wanted to do something more on my own terms which is why i i did go to the avalanche i guess Let's talk about the uh, Ghost of the Avalanche, mm-hmm. two piece, yeah, punk rock, bass and drums. You, Amelia Pereira, mm-hmm. briefly. Uh, who's your drummer now? A uh, guy called Robbo Clark or Robert Clark. Of course it is. I'm yeah. sorry, Rob. I forgot the name. <laughs> Yeah. I've been out there. I feel like I've been out the scene for five years yeah. at this point. <laughs> sorry. Um, you don't even know who they are, man. <laughs> <laughs> that t shirt um, you wear, name me three songs. <laughs> very short songs yeah um you blast out a few eps in quite a short succession didn't you was it two eps in a year or something like that oh, right? i can't remember well we we had a we had a backlog of songs i guess because it was again it's that new new thing new and exciting new and shiny so we were just knocking out songs you know and, and also in a style that was new for me to be writing in and singing in yeah because yeah. you'd only been doing uh harmonies and backing vocals up to that point yep. is that right yeah yeah with the operation and and uh with the ghost of the avalanche uh you are the front man yeah it was, and and i guess with ghost of the avalanche it was again i said i came out the back of empire and i wanted to do something on my terms that i was in control of um so i and i wanted to up my skill up my skills mate so i um i thought well i listened to all this this music i want to 
do music like that and I'm if I'm gonna do it I'm gonna be the vocalist I'm gonna write the songs you know and also I want to challenge myself with my instrument so how I would write a Ghost of Avalanche song would be very different to how I either you know write an Empire song or whatever so it was kind of taking the idea of a bass guitar and what I knew about bass and and challenging myself to to play that instrument in a different way that would hopefully or try at least to cover the sonic spectrum of what a guitar and a bass would do and fill that space and that gave me kind of a blueprint to to write towards which is probably why we ended up with a lot of songs in a very short space of time that were short <laughs> yeah you know? and um we gigged quite a bit with you guys in the in the early days i think we complimented each other quite well because at that time sick ones was just guitar and drums we had like vocals. a band between us didn't we yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you guys are just bass and drums it yeah. was uh that was, it was interesting we could play um, small spaces <coughs> we? So we could just leave stuff set up <laughs> yeah guitar one side bass over that's that's let's not bother with changing all the equipment it would, touring would have been so easy if yeah we, we should have done we'd, that we got in a van uh we might still do that yeah, yeah. the future is ours at some point yeah tell me what's happening with ghost of the avalanche now because i do want to talk about merida burials and then yeah. I, I know that i've got to let you go off and yeah, put no the problem. little one to bed thank you um so ghost of the avalanche right now is is uh in stasis but not mm. because of, uh, not because of anything we're doing internally it's because of this bloody pandemic so and that's another reason why I'm, i've done a bit more merida burial stuff recently as well um so rob uh we did um the Civil Unrest EP in 2019, and we were doing some shows to promote that when COVID hit um, into the early part of 2020. So I think the last gig we did was March 2020, and we've not played since. We've been in contact a lot. I've been writing demos. The problem is Rob doesn't have like a home setup, uh, like an electric kit or anything. So it's very hard for us to kind of do things remotely together. Um, but before the lockdown rules changed, we were planning, we were going to go into the studio to do a, a live album like a, a, a televised you know via the internet um live set uh, and record the soundtrack from that and release it as a mix it properly and release it as a live album which is still on the cards and this year we were planning on going to, to record our debut album proper you know um which we may still get to do so there's a whole bunch of ideas that just need Rob and I to get in a room together and and thrash out and I think that will happen fairly quickly once we're allowed to and what are your main influences when it comes to Meadow, Meadow Bear, um, uh, when it comes to Ghost of the Avalanche? Because the operation was very much, it was, it was very kind of, there was Foo Fighters going on, mm -hmm. there was mm -hmm. Stereophonics going on, there was some feeder going on in there, yeah. um, a bit of Brit pop maybe yeah. in, in, in some ways. With the operation, there was three people with very different influences, you mm. know, and I mean, Al, Al, Alex was the, the main, predominantly the main songwriter for the operation and, you know, 90% maybe more than like 5% of the songs were, were his, his ideas at least, you know, that we all contributed to. Uh, but with Ghost of Avalanche, you know, for me, it was really digging into my love of punk and hardcore and most stuff that most people don't like, you know, general public wise. So it was kind of refreshing to, I took a lot of what I learned about songwriting from Al and being in the operation. And I think it's funny, you listen to Ghost of Avalanche, although it's heavy music, there's still those hooks in there. There's still, pop sensibilities to it um i think yeah. so anyway but yeah it's kind of coming from a different angle it's approaching songwriting from a different uh, from a different angle and bass playing but um yeah so influences i guess are things like the bronx good good punk bands that have good songs so the bronx the misfits black flag obviously um mm -hmm. death from above from a stylistic point of view in terms of the bass and the drum thing that was hugely influential to my ears when i first heard that um so you can kind of see how all that goes into a melting pot to, to create what goes to the avalanche is and be, or what became and still is. The first time I, I met you ever mm. was, and I think I've told you this story before, I'll say it for the benefit of the podcast, was that uh, I had this Misfits t-shirt that I loved and I felt like it was only me and my two mates in this yeah. Scream 92 band that knew the Misfits. Mm. And obviously others had to know them because we were in Froome and they, you know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? Like, you, you knew they were, so someone <laughs> yeah. else must have, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, and... 
And I had a T-shirt of them. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, but it just, I just didn't know, didn't know anyone that liked them and didn't know anyone's talking about them. I didn't see them talked about when I was looking into like punk history. Like they don't get mentioned like the Ramones mm-hmm. get mentioned. They don't get mentioned like Black Flag and Dead Kennedys. They do so more so now. Yeah. But but when at that time, I just don't know what, what was... But the Ramones, the Ramones are a great example of a punk band with amazing songs. They're pop yeah. songs. They're, they're, like yeah. the, they're like the Beatles, but like just played... Hundred times faster. Do you know what I mean? And and that to me is something that's always in the back of my mind is that I want, although if I'm making aggressive heavy music, I still want it to be people to go, that's a good song, you know, or that's that's got something about it which I'll remember or, you know. And that's what the misfits were. I mean, like I said, I, w- I walked into the rehearsal studio, which was owned by Will Angeloro, yeah. who has been on this pod. He was on the inauguration special recently. He was in season one. Mm. Um, he owned the rehearsal space. And I walked in, I saw you wearing a horror business t-shirt. And I was like, ah, a friend. Yeah. You know, I it, wish it, I still it, had that t-shirt, man. I doubt it fit me now, but uh, it was a cool t-shirt. <laughs> it was a great t-shirt. Uh, and that was uh, that was sort of how we met, was to bond mm. over, the, over the misfits. Uh, and we still talk about the misfits. It's, uh, probably once a month something happens and, and we mention yeah. it to each other I didn't um, go say it's probably once a fortnight even if just <laughs> passing <laughs> <laughs> what was I going to say I was going to say that uh, Danzig wrote although he was singing about cutting the heads off little girls and uh, and all kinds of horrible horror movie yeah. business the structures of the Misfits songs the first wave Misfits with Glenn Danzig on vocals they are pop songs. Yeah, they are. And they are like little power pop songs at times. They're just so, they're so hooky. They're so, and the, with the backing vocals, with the hoo-hoo, hoo-hoos mm. and little woos and ahs and oohs and... Yeah, yeah. I borrowed a lot of that uh, in my stuff, definitely. Uh, and um, uh, and I, I hear that in Ghost of the Avalanche. Mm. Yeah, well, they're, they're, yeah, that's, you're spot on. And, and in a way, like a band like The Misfits are kind of like the alternative songbook aren't they of america and i think there's bands like that in the uk as well bands which weren't necessarily mainstream but their songs have stood the test of time and and actually like you said with the misfits on paper they're terrible you know but their recording's awful the playing's not great you know (laughs) yeah they they were you know they they had a bit of reputation for being a bit jockey and all the rest of it but uh but if you boil it down to its core it's great songwriting you know uh, with energy and that's something i try and yeah put into everything i do now yeah. they translate onto acoustic guitar weirdly yeah. yeah and that that is really i think is the benchmark for a lot of things you know i write a lot on acoustic i write a lot on acoustic guitar so yeah totally so you can take a song and, and you can and you can make it acoustic and it's mm. and it still sounds beautiful and pleasant and, and lovely and definitely and that's the sign of a great song so ghost of the avalanche is in stasis on a, sort of an enforced pandemic yeah. hiatus yeah. So you you started uh, Meadow Burials in when two thousand and nineteen? Actually, Meadow Burials uh, dates was back early? to pre Ghost of the Avalanche in, in right. honestly because it was just me record you know maybe writing songs that which weren't appropriate for the operation or any of the bands I was in. So I built up a little collection of ideas on a on a laptop, and it was only a few years later that I was I think like cleaning out this old laptop. You'd get rid of old files and stuff, making room for my uh, spreadsheets, you know, data core stuff. Uh, that, I know, <laughs> that I noticed I had some of these old recordings and I listened to some of them. I was like, actually, you know, most of it was was garbage, but there was there was a few nuggets in there that I thought, actually, that's quite cool. And I revisited them. So uh, on the first Mono Barrels EP, I think there's a song, I think the very first track predates Ghost of the Avalanche and may have even been written during, it was definitely written when I was living with Al, so it would have been written whilst I was in the operation. Um so it was just ideas, punk punk songs I was writing, and, and I thought, well, it's better to do something with them than, than sit on a hard drive. So I just put them out as kind of demos. And um, we were doing a lot of gigs for a, a label at the time, a promo, promo label uh, based in Birmingham called D Duster. So Ghost of the Adventure was going up to Birmingham, not playing shows then. Great guys, great shows. You should check them out. Um, really great label. And I just happened to send these demos to the guy, Paul, who... who runs that and I was like oh look, look what I found on my laptop I think these, there's something here kind of cool He and he was like instantly like I'll put that out you know I think I was right. trying to get him to put Ghost of the Avalanche out and I, I sent him some of these Meadow Barrows demos and he's like yeah I'll put that out and he has subsequently put out Ghost of the Avalanche so we're both both Meadow Barrows and Ghost of the Avalanche are on uh, D-Dasta or D-Dasta however you want to say it but yeah so it kind of just happened it wasn't really planned um, and then once I'd done that EP and it sold you know fairly well as as a small punk man that doesn't really exist can 
I sort of kind of wrote more and more in that vibe and, and then did the the EP I told you about earlier the that was meant to be for floppy disk. <laughs> I just did that with with Ben Turner in the I studio for fun. I love that. And then recently, um, actually it was only last, was it this year? No, last year, end of last year, on my birthday early, on December the 4th, 2020, which is the date I can remember because it's my birthday, I um, put out the the last thing we did, which was called Poems, which was me taking Mary Bearers a little bit more seriously. And 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 I was very fortunate to have um, Jack Taylor from Tax the Heat play drums on it. And uh, I went back into the studio with Ben producing and I, I did everything else on it. So yeah, it's kind of. I love Jack. Yeah, he's a good, good dude. I forgot he's on that actually. Yeah, I've just list. I just listened to uh, to poems mm. before um, before coming on yeah. here. Um, and I did think the drums were good. <laughs> yeah, um, compared to <laughs> compared to my my drumming attempts on the first EP. Yeah, I need I need yeah. to hook you up actually. Perhaps you can do some drums for Meadow Barrels at some point. Hell yeah, yeah, I'll do some of that. So um, yeah, yeah, maybe. it's great. Maybe, maybe they, they, there's your uh, exclusive. Perhaps you're gonna do some drumming for. Uh, you heard it here <laughs> yeah. first on the giant pod. Yeah. Um, I knew there was a reason I started this podcast. There you go. Just to get work. Um... Massive thank you to Nick Wilton for coming on to the giant pod and spending some time catching up with me. We are going to leave links to all of his musical work that we can find online uh, in the show notes descriptions for you to find, enjoy, download stream order whatever you want to do uh make sure that you like this podcast and subscribe please leave a review if you feel so inclined to do so uh if you want to share this with a friend word of mouth is a really really good way to help a show like this grow so if you could just copy the link send it to one of your friends that'd be really really cool if you want to follow this podcast on social media you can the handle is at the giant pod that is for twitter and instagram my personal instagram is andy underscore s1s if you want to follow that this podcast was produced by the multi-instrumentalist harry williams we will see you next week on the giant pod thank you so much